So we are well into earnings season right now. I always love the fourth quarter earnings season that takes place toward the beginning of the year. One, because it stretches on for a long time as companies, some, some companies take more time because they're also reporting their full year results. Um, and because we get like really a full year snapshot of a lot of things that can affect other companies. I, in particular, there's one, one cup, one type of company that I like to watch in earnings season to kind of get a re get a preview of what's going to happen with my other companies that I own. Uh, before we dive in, uh, please take a minute, click, click on the link you see on your screen. You get the top 10 stocks from our sponsor, the Motley Fool, and it's a great way to support this work we're doing. Um, so Tyler is joining me. I'm going to uh, talk about a stock that gives us a good read on how consumers are doing, which has a lot of implications for a lot of the other companies that we invest in. And Tyler's going to talk about a company that has a lot of implications for how the business world is doing. Uh, together, we can kind of get a read on the economy uh, and kind of get a, an economic preview, if you will, as earnings season really starts to kick into high gear and as 2024 gets underway, because these these companies have a lot of implications on the other stocks we invest in. So I'll start with uh, MasterCard, which just recently reported earnings. Visa and MasterCard are really interesting. We we recently did a show where Tyler said Visa is a stock that he loves the business, but he wouldn't buy the stock. I kind of tend to agree because Visa and MasterCard are both kind of expensive right now. Um, but I love watching their earnings report because it tells us a lot about how the American consumer is doing, um, which has clear implications on pretty much every other stock that we in, that is in my portfolio. Um, if people are buying things, it's you know just it's good. A rising tide lifts all boats. So MasterCard surpassed expectations um, when they reported their earnings on both the top and bottom lines, and the big reason for the top line growth is because consumers are being surprisingly resilient in a rising rate environment. Um, their earnings were up 18% year over year, which is solid growth for MasterCard. Um, but it, it was fueled by a combination of expense controls, which are looking pretty good, and top-line revenue growth led by consumer spending. And not just in the U.S., worldwide. MasterCard's gross dollar volume was up 10% worldwide, and that's not just an inflation thing. They process 12% more transactions just by number of transactions in the fourth quarter than they did a year ago. Um, they also often provide some numbers for the current quarter, you know, just kind of after the, the reporting period ended. So we got some January numbers. So far in January 2024, where you know, a lot of people are really uncertain about the economy, interest rates are still relatively high, volume is up. 10% so far in January year over year, just like it was in the third quarter. So it's not slowing down. Cross-border volume is especially strong, up 18% year over year. So people are you know, traveling more. They're, they're, you know, they're spending money um, on international travel a lot more than they were, which continues to surge back after the pandemic. Um, growth is actually a little bit weaker in the U.S. than it is international but the general takeaway is that consumers are still spending money. The big contraction in spending that we were expecting or that we were told was about to happen, um, it's not really panning out. It's really surprising a lot of people, including all the analysts that follow MasterCard, just how resilient consumers look right now. And I personally think that the worst is over in terms of the rising rate environment. I don't think interest rates are going to rise any further than they are right now. Um, unless something really, you know, out of the ordinary happens. I think economic uncertainty is going to start to calm down. I think consumers are going to be more willing to spend money, not less. So the resilience in consumer spending is a big, big, you know, is it's it's a big, you know, catalyst for me, for my investing strategy in general, as I go, we go into 2024, because this has a lot of implications for the banks I invest in. It has a lot of implications for the retail business, for advertising businesses, because advertisers spend a lot more money when consumers are spending more money because they want consumers' money. So there's a lot of different ways this affects my portfolio, and it's really going to shape the way that I invest my money going forward. But that's just the, really the consumer side. Tyler's going to talk about a company that gives us a little bit of insight into how how you know industry is doing. Tyler? Yeah. So I'm going to talk about Nucor, uh, which is one of the 
if not the largest manufacturer of steel in the United States or North America, actually. Um, probably it's a two horse race between Nucor and um, Cleveland Cliffs for big, you know, like Visa MasterCard. Those are the two big steel companies in the United States today. So going into 2024 and kind of 2023, there was there's always been this this looming, you know, economic decline that everybody has been very much on their minds. And it doesn't, it, at least in, in all of 2023, that didn't really seem to be the case. Um, in Nucor's most recent earnings report, and at very similar things were seen in, in Cleveland Cliffs, uh, because I read both of them, uh, volumes for total steel shipped for both companies were very much on par with what we saw in 2022, which is kind of surprising because um, there was some declines in actual like prices, but demand was high. And the part of the reason that was is because if we all remember back in October, we had um, uh, strikes or labor union strikes between uh, auto work, uh, the UAW, uh, the Union of Auto Workers. That particular strike uh, led a lot of kind of distributors and wholesale purchasers of steel to kind of back down on a lot of uh, their actual buying, which brought down prices. And so that's why we saw, a, 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 that was a, a decent proportion of as to why we saw a decline in prices. Uh, and then, you know, once the the the, um, the strikes ended, we kind of resumed business as usual in terms of uh, actual volume shipped. According to Nucor, 2023 volumes were only down 1% compared to 20, uh, 2022. And they're expecting the first quarter uh, in 2024 to always already be an uptick in business relative to this most recent quarter. So we're we're already starting to see uh, a recovery after that uh, UAW strike. And to keep in mind too that when it comes to steel manufacturing in the United States, it pretty much comes down to almost primarily two segments. You either have construction or automotive. That I, mean, I there are others, but when we talk about uh, in terms of total steel consumed, when you when you add those two together, you're talking about you know more than 70% of the market. So it gives you a good idea of like what we're looking at in terms of total steel demand and, and industrial activity. Um, if we think about industrial activity, there's a lot of kind of I guess you could say tailwinds going on there. We've talked a lot of or there's been a lot of discussion around things like the Inflation Reduction Act uh, in terms of green infrastructure. So uh, steel for uh, transmission towers and a lot of kind of the, the bare bones things that you need to do to actually bring a lot of these renewable power assets online. Uh, like we said, automotive, uh, electric vehicle expansion in the United States uh, is a, a huge steel driver because for the most part, a lot of these uh, electrical vehicles are considerably heavier than your typical, you know, small you know, four cylinder engine sedan and therefore the higher, you know, higher strength steel, you need actually a little bit more and it becomes a, um, it, like the percentage of steel used in, in these, um, in these particular vehicles is a little bit higher and the price for it is higher because it, like you said, it needs to be a higher tensile strength steel than what you would normally expect. And so there's a, a quite a few things that these steel companies are seeing in terms of construction in terms of automotive production and to, it, across the economy that all suggest things are still going pretty good for the industrial economy. Um, Multi-family home construction, so apartment buildings, are at a 40-year high, which you know is much more of a steel a, a component of using steel than it is lumber for like you know residential. So you, you kind of tie all those things together, and it, it appears, at least so far, that the economy on the industrial side is doing well and as matt alluded to the consumer side is doing relatively well as well you tie those things together and i i'm actually i'm not going to say that we're headed for interest rate hikes but all these things bode for a relatively robust economy that doesn't look like we're headed for a downturn and that to me suggests that we're probably just going to stay where we are for a long time like i know everyone's waiting like when rate cuts but what if we just kind of stay here for the whole year? I don't think that's an unreasonable expectation uh, for much of 2024. 
Once again, thank you so much for joining me. Be sure to click subscribe if you don't subscribe to my channel already. And as always, this video is sponsored by The Motley Fool. Be sure to visit www.fool.com slash Frankel to receive the 10, top 10 best stocks to buy now.